Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're waiting for everybody to come in. Everybody's kind of rolling in, so we're going to wait just a minute until the whole group gets here. In the meantime, as you come in, um, let us know where you're tuning in from. And do us a favor and keep your videos off so that we can keep all of our limelight on the scientists because they have some really great stuff to show you tonight. Okay, welcome everybody that's just now come in. We're still waiting, we're ad admitting a few more people. And in the meantime, let us know where you are. Oh, I see a Largo, Florida, Clearwater, Florida. All right. Oh my gosh, somebody just said they were tuning in from India. Sugarfoot Gainesville. Archer, Tampa, wow, we've got a wide range here. All right, we're still waiting on a few people to come in. People are coming in through the waiting room, just like you guys did. And we have a really exciting night for you guys. Even though there is some rain out there, don't worry. We still have an amazing night planned. We've got some great scientists who are well prepared for that. Um, just a reminder, we're going to ask everybody to keep their videos off tonight so that all the limelight can be on our scientists because they do have some really fun stuff to show you all. So it's 8.31 and we're gonna give everybody just one more second. Somebody's tuning in from Spain, St. Augustine, Florida. Coral Springs, another one from there. Jacksonville, great. New York, all right. Lakeland. We really miss seeing everybody in person, but it's pretty cool to have a lot of viewers and a lot of participants from all over the place. That is, this is great, this is awesome. And just a reminder guys, um, we're gonna have everyone keep their video off tonight just so our scientists um, get, get all the attention here because they really have a lot of fun stuff to show you. But it's officially 8.32, and so we're gonna continue to let people roll in, but we're gonna go ahead and get started. So an official hello to everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight to meet some of the best nightlife in town. And my name is Johnny, and I work at the Florida Museum, and I'm gonna be your host for this evening. But tonight we're gonna meet a variety of University of Florida entomologists, and these of course are scientists who study insects. And they all have light sheets set up in their own backyards to attract bugs. And we actually have a poll for you. It should pop up on your screen. And we're wondering um, who all is actually watching for bugs in their own backyard tonight. Now, I know the rain might have scared some of us off, um, and that's a total valid response. But maybe you're inspired to go out there after tonight when you get a little bit more information and do it again. All right, we have, we have a good amount here that have light sheets set up. Some people that are encouraged to do it after the live stream, that'll be a good time. The rain will probably have passed. All right. All right, this is fun. Okay, well, we're gonna get started, but just a few requests. Um, you'll notice that you're muted. And um, if you have um, any questions for our scientists though, we do want you to um, ask those and do that through the Zoom chat. But um, when you ask a question, just make sure that you address it to everyone, not a specific scientist. And um, that's because Chelsea is um, one of our educators and she's kind of behind the scenes and she's gonna be compiling all of your questions um, so that we can ask them live to our scientists. So please do ask questions and um, make sure that um, you just address them to everyone. In addition, we've planted a few bug experts into the chat and um, they're gonna be answering some questions along the way that we don't get to because we probably won't be able to get to everyone's questions live. Um, again, if you're just joining us, please remember to keep your videos turned off. That way our scientists have the limelight and we can show you the cool stuff that they have um, in their own backyards. Last but not least, if you're having any technical difficulty, um, feel free to send a message directly to Alberto Tech Support. He's another one of our cohorts. 
co-host, and he will do his best to assist you with any difficulties that you're having. Okay, are you guys ready? Let's get started, and we're going to meet all of our scientists. And Akito, let's start with you. Um, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, my name is Akito Kawahara, and I'm an associate curator at the Florida Museum of Natural History here in Gainesville. Um, I study moths and butterflies, and I, I absolutely love moths. Moths are one of the greatest groups on the planet. There's over 150,000 species uh, on the, in the world, and here in Florida, we have several hundred as well. I'm interested in how they got here, what are they doing, why are there so many, these kinds of questions. Over to you, Matt and Kristen. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Matt Standridge. I work in the Daniels Lab at the Florida Museum of Natural History, um, and I am a conservation technician, um, so I mainly work with endangered species of butterflies. Kristen? I'm Kristen Rossetti, and I'm the conservation coordinator for the Daniels Lab at the Florida Museum, and I work with the endangered Miami blue butterfly and the endangered Chausa's swallowtail, among other things. My name's Sarah and I work with Matt and Kristen, also on endangered butterflies. I am a graduate student at the Florida Museum of Natural History and at the Department of Entomology and Nematology. Over to you, Andrea and Yuri. Hi, we just had to dash out of the rain. I'm Andrea Lucky. I'm an entomologist at the University of Florida Entomology and Nematology Department. I specialize in the evolution of ants, and hopefully we'll see a bunch of ants out here tonight. Big female ants flying around, and all those weird little males that look just like sneaky little wasps. And I'm Yuri. I'm a forest, the forest entomology at the university, meaning I study bugs in forests, mostly barbados, and they come to light too. Back to you, Johnny. All right, thank you, everyone. Okay, so. I bet everyone in our audience is curious about the different light sheets that our scientists have set up. Um, and so we're going to go over to Sarah. And Sarah, I wonder if you can tell us just, you know, briefly, what exactly is a light sheet? Why does it work? Yeah, absolutely. So a light sheet can be really, really simple or it can be a little bit more complicated. It can be as simple as honestly just turning on your porch light. Um, but it can also be more complicated. Some of us, you'll notice, have sort of special light bulbs. You can see different colors. Um, but my setup here, I just have an old sheet that I bought at a thrift store hanging from a clothesline. And I have two light bulbs. I have a UV light and a, um, a mercury vapor bulb. Um, and then I think Akito is going to tell us a little bit more about why those lights work and the, how different bugs come to different wavelengths of light. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. So um, different kinds of insects come to different uh, lights. Um, in my setup here, it's a little bit hard to see maybe, but there's a, a, a big strong bulb here. This is a metal halide light. It's kind of the light you can use. Um, you can buy it at a plant. Uh, it's like a plant growth light. Um, and this one's about 300 watts, so it's really bright. I'm getting UV from it, so I'm actually getting a, a tan right now. Uh, over there, there's a black light. That's the same kind of bulb that um, Sarah has. And the idea is to, to attract different kinds of light to, at night uh, because different kinds of insects are attracted to different wavelengths. And um, it's typically UV that attracts them. So both of these bulbs are UV. And we, we try to do this kind of activity when there's no moon. And I know Andrew's going to talk about this a little bit uh, later, uh, but you want to do it when there's no moon. And uh, one more thing I just wanted to mention that it's important to, do, uh, to think about turning off your lights as well. Uh, when you're not doing these kinds of activities. So light pollution is a really big problem right now, and lots of insects are, are dying because people are leaving their lights on, and we need to uh, make sure we don't do that. Insects, of course, are really important for pollination. Uh, they're decomposers. Uh, we get all kinds of fruits from them, half the fruits that you get at your grocery store from insects. Uh, insects are absolutely amazing, uh, and we just uh, shouldn't forget that. So let's make sure we turn off our lights. Over. Great, thank you. So. It sounds like you guys have some pretty high-tech lights out there. And Akito, you mentioned UV and how insects are attracted to that. Um, so that makes me wonder, you know, how are insects getting around at night? How are they navigating? Andrea, maybe you can tell us a little bit more. Are they just kind of bumping around in the dark, finding their way around? Or um, how does it work? Why are these lights that we're using actually, actually working to attract insects? So this is such a cool question. Actually, it's a cool answer because 
insects actually navigate by the moon and the stars. And so when they are flying around, they are doing this very cool thing, which is essentially keeping themselves on a steady course, keeping the moon always at a, at a, a, a similar angle to their eyes. Now we can trick them. We basically crack their little code by putting up a light. So they keep going closer and closer to this light, thinking they're keeping it at the same angle. They get confused and they start spinning around it. You've seen this happen with a moth and a flame. But um, the other thing is that, you know, normally the lights are up there, the moon's up high. If our lights are down here, they get disoriented. They land on the sheet, they kind of recalibrate, and this gives us the opportunity to look at them. And then after we're done collecting them or looking at them at the, on the sheet, we can turn off our lights and they'll go about their merry way, navigating by the moon and the stars, just like before. Great, so then that's what makes this so nice because this can definitely be sort of a catch and release type of event where nobody's harmed, but we all get to enjoy the amazing biodiversity around us. Um, so it sounds like a sheet is an important component because that gives the insects somewhere to land once they've been attracted there with the lights, which are also an important component. Um, but I have a feeling there is something else that really makes everything sort of come together. And Yuri, I'm going to jump over to you and maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what that extra component is that, that really makes um, light, uh, light sheeting special. Hello. Well, so one, it's raining. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> that brings a whole pile of bugs from dirt that a lot of insects that have been sitting in the dry dirt and now they're all happy coming out. But really, the main point I was going to try to get across is that it's not just the light, right? The, the insects have to come from somewhere and the somewhere is all around us. And so this is why a lot of people who like insects <coughs> have yards that look messy, but that really means natural. That means bushes, dead wood, swamps. You kind of guess what my opinion is on lawns and fertilization and insecticides, right? I don't have to comment on that, but as natural as possible. So they have a way to come from. Great. Well said. Um, okay, but what about those of us that maybe um, don't have big yards and don't have special fancy equipment um, that, you know, some of, some of our entomologists have? Um, I'm going to go over to Matt and Kristen. Maybe you can let us know if um, we don't have an ideal location for light sheeting or maybe our neighbor is, uh, has too many porch lights on. Um, what, where else can we go? Is there somewhere else around town that we can look for bugs? Yeah, absolutely. Other than just your porch in your backyard. Um, uh, any gas stations uh, just outside of town, especially, are really great places to go uh, look for bugs. Um, anywhere where there's a lot of darkness and then, uh, you know, a, a huge source of light, they'll, they will be attracted to that. And that's something that a lot of entomologists do when they're collecting is, is go to gas stations just outside of town. Um, just so if you do decide to do this, I would recommend going inside and speaking to the gas station attendant before wandering around the building in the middle of the night. It's a good idea in general. Yeah, that's a great point. And gas stations are definitely sort of a best kept secret for especially even entomology students who are out there looking for insects. Um, but yeah, always, always let the employees know what you're doing because it might look a little creepy if you're walking around the lights just sort of staring at the walls, but you can find some really amazing things. So big takeaways from this, a porch light, if you don't have fancy lights, is just fine. But remember not to leave your porch light on all the time because that can disorient insects. Um, if you don't have a great location or a great neighborhood for um, collecting insects, um, try, try a gas station on the periphery of town. You might be surprised what you can find. Okay, so next up, um, our scientists are gonna show off some of the things that um, they've found, some live stuff. Um, but really quickly, we have another poll for you. We wanna know how many people are actually participating or watching tonight in your household. So um, let us know because we're curious to see how many of you are actually out there watching. So that'll pop up on your screen. All right, we've got some people with five out there. Looks like a lot of twos as well, maybe some, some fun buggy date nights. Threes and fours. 
A lot of ones as well, great. All right. Okay, so before we head over to the sheets, um, I just wanted to, to share with you, um, I'm gonna share my screen actually with you and I'm gonna go ahead and get that ready to do here. And I think you should be able to see um, some guides here. They're actually silhouettes of insects. And, uh, you know, I think one of the most fun things for me when I'm out uh, light sheeting is seeing the diversity of insects that come out to the sheet. And um, this, these guides right here are actually, they look really simple, but they're some of the best guides, um, especially if you're a beginner, um, because you can tell what type of insect you're looking at sometimes just by the silhouette, which is really fun. So whether it's a luna moth or um, a big water bug, um, these are really, really great guides. And in the Eventbrite link that we sent you, um, there's actually a link to digital content where you can follow that link and download these. So we have those uploaded for you if you're interested. Some other great guides, if you want to go a little bit more in depth, um, are the Kaufman Guide and the National Wildlife Federation for um, just insects in general. And then the Peterson Field Guide to Moths. And this one is specific to, south, to the Southeastern um, North America. Um, these are all really great things that I think most all entomologists have on their bookshelf. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing these with you because we will send you a link to all of these things after the show tonight. So don't worry if you didn't get to write all that down. Um, but we're going to head over to um, Sarah because I think Sarah, you have a few things that are um, live to show us. Am I right? Yes, uh, if I can get them to cooperate because they are, as you said, live. So the first thing I'll show you here is, let me switch to my other camera here is an eyed click beetle. Let me get, get it so you guys can all see it very well here. There we go. And now this may look familiar to a lot of folks who live on the East Coast. Um, and the reason it's called a, a click beetle is actually because it does make an audible click sound um, if you bother it. Now, because it's windy, you probably won't be able to hear it. But um, and the other neat thing about them is those eye spots glow in the dark. Um, so yeah, they are very cool bugs, and I will get another one prepped. Uh, maybe some other folks have something on their sheets or Sure, um, Akito, I think you have some things hanging around too, do you not? Yeah, I do. I can show you some things. I was going to talk about Luna Moss in a little bit. I can show you there's a Luna Moth that came in. I don't know if you can see this, but it's right, uh, sorry, it's right here. Yeah. Can, can people see this? I don't know if you can see this, but anyway, there's a luna moth in here. Uh, there is uh, one of the really cool moths around here. It's called a rosy maple moth, and it's pink. It's one of the real weird pink moths, and it's right here in my hand. It's a little bit hard to see, but it's a pink and yellow moth, one of the most beautiful moths in, in the area. Um, I can try to take out the, the, the luna moth. Uh, this one came yesterday uh, around, um, maybe around uh, three o'clock in the morning. See this? Um, and so these guys come later in the night usually. They, they don't come right at dark. So this is another reason why you may want to keep your light on uh, over a, a longer period of time to, to try to attract different kinds of insects at different, that come at different times of the night. Thanks. Great, so that's a great point, Akito. And so um, we have honest entomologists here who are um, ready to admit that some of these things that you're looking at tonight that they have, um, have not all come to their sheet um, right now tonight since we signed on. Um, and Akito, um, he's gonna talk a little bit more about Luna Moths later. Um, and maybe he can tell us a little bit more about some of the different conditions later on that, um, that uh, you know, make insects come out throughout different times of the night. Um, in the meantime, let's hop back over to um, Sarah, because it looks like she has somebody else to show us. Um, well, it just flew back onto the sheet. Let me see if I can grab it back here. And here is another one. Of course, this is the risk with working with live animals. Now, this is a large scarab beetle. Um, some people call them June bugs or May bugs, depending on where you live. Um, and we have many, many species of scarabs. They're in the family Scarabiidae. And maybe 
somebody, one of the other experts actually may know which species this is, but I do not. And they're quite abundant right now. They are really living up to their name being that it is late May here. All right. It's beautiful. Now, Matt and Kristen, I think, also have something fun to show us. Um, are you guys ready to, to pull that out? Yeah, I'm going to turn the camera around here really quick, I think, and show you a couple things. There we go. All right. Okay, so right here, I have a male. Eye moth, and I'm going to see if I press on its back. Maybe I can get it to show its eye spots. One second, just very gently. Well, here, maybe I'll just show you guys. Okay, Chris, could you hold the light? Um, so these eye spots, uh, they they use that as a. I'm sorry, can you see it? Yeah, we can see that. All right. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, these uh, eye spots, when they're disturbed, they flash these eye spots and it's a defensive measure against predators where it looks like a big pair of threatening eyes, not a uh, fluffy defenseless little moth. Um, then we also have, I believe this is a Tersa Sphinx Aikido. Is that? Uh, it's, it's, another, it's a different species. Okay, uh -huh. all right. Um, yeah, just something that showed up uh, last night. And then we have many, many katydids um, all over our sheet. To see the, my yard seems very popular for these guys. Um, and the last thing I want to show you here is a, will you take this away? Mm -hmm. um, is an under, whoop, well, <laughs> a little, a little too. Uh, there, it's uh, a, a keto, do you know? Uh, what this is, I believe it's uh, it, well, it's an, uh, an underwing moth where yeah, they it's have. It's a katakala, it's an underwing for sure. Yeah. And these guys generally come to bait, I believe. Um, but this one showed up at the light last night as well. And that's, that's what I got. Beautiful, thank you. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about baiting later. Um, and let me hop over to Andrea and Yuri and make sure they don't have anything um, hanging out in their yard or on their sheet that they want to show us as well. We have lots of little things and that is to us at least the real sweet stuff because you know they may be little but each of these species has their own story. Uh, they have their millions of years old stories and there are just so many. That's really the core of biodiversity. And that of course includes my favorite bark beetles too. There is one. Yuri, what are bark beetles? Bark beetles live in the bark or under bark of trees. That's why they're called bark beetles. And most people kind of would know the bad bark beetles that are known for killing trees. The reality is that there are 6,000 species of them in the world. And the vast majority are just happy members of the bug diversity, like this one. Uh, and they don't do anything bad. We kind of need them. If you were to look at those guys up really closely under a microscope, do they all kind of look the same? Oh, no. Uh, those are, they have, well, they all look kind of like a cigar-shaped thing because they have to drill inside wood. Uh, and so they're all cylindrical. But besides that, their butts are different. Their mouths are different. Their colors and hairs and everything about each species is different. The most fa fascinating thing is that some of them carry fungi with them as farmers. They plant those fungi inside trees and that's what they really feed on. That's a true symbiosis. They, are the, they, they were doing farming way before people. Interesting. All right. Okay, so um, really quickly, we're going to take a, a, a short break from the live stuff, but I do want to ask, um, maybe Matt, maybe you can tell us should we worry, uh, those of us that are out there with sheets, do we really need to worry about getting bitten or stung or harmed by anything that's on our sheath? Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay. Hear <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, no, generally, once things are on the sheet, they stay there. Um, they're, they're not going to um, come off. I, I, 
don't generally get a whole lot of wasps, but I definitely have in the past. And I've never had any kind of problem with those. But something that you do want to think about is your choice of clothing. Um, and you don't want to wear uh, bright colors, especially when you're using a, um, a UV light. Uh, no clothes, you don't want to wear any clothes that are really reflective because then you essentially become another sheet um, where the bugs will fly at you. So um, if you want to avoid that, I would recommend dark clothing. Although if you want to be covered in bugs, that's okay too. Absolutely, to each their own. Okay, Akito, I want to go back to you and I want you to tell us a little bit more about Luna moths because you have done a lot of research on those. Um, and I also have a, a video here that I'm ready to show whenever, whenever you'd like me to cue that. Um, but can you tell us a little bit more about these really beautiful moths that are common in, in Gainesville, at least? Yeah, Luna moths are, are amazing. They're, they're pretty common here in, in Florida, Central Florida. Here's the caterpillar. This is a Luna moth caterpillar. I don't know if you can see it, but, but there it is. Uh, this is a near final instar. It's looking for a food. It's sweet gum. This is what it feeds on. Just a side point. I just I have to show you this because it's absolutely crazy and so cool. This is a relative of a Luna moth. It's called a pine devil. Look at this thing. It's so enormous. This is my finger. It's about the size of my finger. Amazing insects. Uh, these are moths that feed on uh, pines that are related to Luna moths. So let's go back to Luna moth. Uh, that caterpillar, the green caterpillar that I first showed you, is what gave rise to that uh, big uh, Luna moth that, that we were just looking at earlier. Um, the, the one that has tails. And one of the really cool things about Luna moths is uh, the reason why they have these tails. And we actually didn't know this, these, these, these long tails that these Luna moths have, uh, these long tails. We didn't actually know this until a few years ago that they're actually used to, uh, against bats. So the, the point of the tails is to uh, make bats confused. So when the Luna moth is flying, the tails actually spin and the spinning causes it to create an illusion, which makes bats think that there's a small moth flying and they can't sense the big moth, the actual Luna moth, and they bite the tail instead, and then and the Luna moth escapes. So it's an anti-predator defense strategy. And I think she's gonna, um, Johnny's gonna show a video here, but it's, it's one of the really coolest things. And, and this is why if you look at a Luna moth closely, they have twisted tails. And the twisted tails are what creates that spinning and that creates the illusion that confuses the bats and make them, makes them bite the, the tail end of the, of the insect. Um, another really cool fact about Luna moths is that they uh, don't feed as adults. So they have no mouth parts. They don't eat at all. Uh, during their short lifespan as adults. All that eating comes uh, when they're, when they're uh, caterpillars. Um, I love them so much that I actually named my daughter, uh, her middle name is Luna, named after Luna moths. Um, yes, I love moths. That's, that's what I got about Luna moths. All right, that's great. I'm showing this video one more time so that if I, in case somebody missed it, you can see those two tails and the bat comes in and there's that just one tail remaining. But the Luna moth itself, its body, which is the important part, is still intact because butterflies and moths can still fly with um, a considerable amount of wing loss, correct? That's right. There's so much going on in your backyard and the bats are just major predators of these insects. There's just so many things that, like some of these moths produce ultrasound. I, and I know we don't probably don't have time to talk about this, but maybe during the question portion later, we can talk about this. But lots of insects produce ultrasound uh, at bats and we can talk about that separately. They jammed them, it's just awesome. Yeah, that's great. We'll, we'll hopefully get to that. But right now, I want to turn to some of our uh, viewer questions and, and ask you guys some of the questions that we have. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and if you guys want to listen in and give me a, our scientists can give me a thumbs up on the screen um, if you're up for answering the question. So we have somebody that asks, um, hey, we live in a, a grass field at the edge of the woods, oak, oak trees mostly. Um, would the moths be more likely to be in the forest or out in the field? Anybody, maybe Akito, you can answer that one. Uh, so it depends on the kinds of moths. Some moths uh, go, are, are fly in, the, in fields, but those are the ones that tend to generally have more defenses against predators, like just what we were talking about earlier about uh, like bats. Cluttered environments tend to have um, uh, lots of moths that have different kinds of defenses. They tend to be slower flyers, so they're not, uh, you know, if wind comes by and they get blown around, they don't end up somewhere else. Um, because uh, cl uh, cluttered environments tend to have less wind. I don't know if that answers the question. And we, Akito, one more question for you. Um, just a, a, we have some general questions, people asking, um, 
where where can Luna Moss be found? Um, is it j just Florida, somewhere specific? Oh, it's, it's Eastern United States mainly. Um, and down here, there's many generations, so they start coming out in you know in February. Uh, up north, you'll see them in May or June. Um, so they feed on sweet gum mainly. So that's one of their host plant here in Central Florida. There's lots of sweet gum all over the place, and Luna Moss are are around here all over the place. Right now, they're they're flying. Right, this is like the the second generation right now this week. Tonight it's raining, it's, it's great. This is like perfect, perfect Luna time. We love it. <laughs> okay, so can somebody tell us what kind of sheets would you recommend for trapping nocturnal insects? Do you need to buy like fancy Egyptian cotton, 4,000 thread count? What's, what's the best thing to, to get? Sarah, can you, can you give us some info? Yeah, sure. Um, honestly, you can put together um, a trap like this out of almost anything. Um, you can make it fancy, you know, if you want it to be very resistant and wind resistant people. Some folks use a uh, heavy canvas with um, a frame. Um, I think most of us are just using plain old bed sheets. Um, I bought mine from a thrift store for $2 um, and it's just hung up on my regular clothesline. Um, and honestly, you can attract lots of insects without even having a special sheet. Um, any any light colored surface, like Matt was talking about earlier, will um, attract them and help them stand out to you. So even if you just have a wall under your porch light that is a little lighter colored, you can attract lots of really cool insects just by leaving your porch light on um, and then remembering it to turn it off once you're done and don't need it anymore. Perfect. Thank you. And um, actually, Sarah, maybe you can go ahead. Um, this is sort of related. Uh, we have a question about what side of the sheet that you're supposed to collect the insects on. So are they coming to the side of the sheet with the light or are they coming on the other side? Um, they come to both. Um, so really, um, as Andrea explained earlier, the insects are confusing the lights, light or lights for, for the moon. And so if the insect is coming from the direction in front of your sheet, they'll usually land on the side with the light on it. Um, but other insects coming from the other direction may land on the back. So that's actually a really good thing that that person brought up. Um, it's important to remember to get up and walk around to the back of your sheet because there could be something really cool back there that you don't see if you're just sitting on the front side. Great, thanks. And uh, Akito, I think we might be going back to you again for this question. How long do luna moths live? Uh, they, they only live a few days, maybe a week at most uh, as adults, as caterpillars, um, they will li live, you know, several weeks uh, and then and then they pupate. And the, so it, again, it depends on where you are. Uh, in Florida, they, the caterpillars will live a few weeks and they'll pupate and they'll be a cocoon or a pupa or a cocoon for uh, a couple of weeks and then they become an adult and they wait until the rain comes. So like I said before, tonight's great. Tomorrow you will see luna moss if you're in a place, if you if there are luna moss and, and you have a light like this, uh, it, it, you should be able to see some, I think. Um, but if you're further north, the, the, the last generation, the one in the fall, will overwinter. So that one takes uh, longer time as a, as a cocoon. Great. Um, okay, just a couple more questions before we move on. And Yuri, I think this one may be directed at you if you're available. Um, we have somebody asking in the chat um, about how to sort of mitigate if they live somewhere with HOA and um, there's, you know, a lot of neighbors around them that are using pesticides or if they're required to spray their house. Um, is there something else you can do to sort of mitigate that to still attract bugs to your yard? You know, that's a political question. <laughs> Uh, I think it's called outreach and it's called being a good neighbor and inspire people because we are really in a sort of a strange situation. If you don't mind, I'm just going to quickly turn also this camera because we are just having an amazing uh, visitor. It's a, this ginormous uh, longhorn beetle. Ah, come here. It's, it's probably going to bite me, but it's really important. Ah, yeah, yeah, it's gone. Okay, never mind. Uh, so, you know, how do you convince people that when they are pouring insecticides on their lawn, they're actually creating a death trap for everything that flies around? It's about communication, I think. That's what it is. And maybe being a steward in your own yard, like if you can maybe not spray your own nectar sources or if you have um, host plants for butterflies, making sure those are um, pesticide and insecticide free. 
Right. Uh, it turns out that creating a habitat for insects is really easy. What you should do is not to do very much and let nature take its course. Do you have a, do you have a sort of a dead and dying tree? Just leave it there. Do you have some bushes there? Leave them there. You know, there's, if you have a lawn that's not doing really well, that's great because it's gonna have little flowers and little other, other plants coming up. So my approach would be do less and the bugs will be better off. Yeah, that makes some of us feel a little bit better when we forget to mow our lawns maybe and there's some weeds in there. Um, it's okay, we're actually doing something for, for, the, for the insects, right? Um, Akito, if you can just, um, no need to, to answer, if you can just hold up the caterpillar can, close to your screen, um, those, that would be great. Which caterpillar? Um, I think either either or both, the, the pine devil this and one, the- This is the pine devil, yeah. finger sized, super awesome. One of the best caterpillars uh, found here in, uh, in central Florida. Um, this is a, a luna moth. I think I showed this one earlier too, uh, but this is um, kind of a green, greenish guy. Uh, this is close to final instar. You see that? Uh, chewing, loves sweet gum. It's chewing away um, and eating away, getting plump. This one's uh, about, yeah, it's close to about half, a little bit over half my finger. So I can actually, um, for those of you interested, screen share really quick because I know it's dark out there. Um, but you can see here in a little bit greater detail that, that, that pine devil caterpillar that Akito has. Um, can everybody see my screen? Thumb, thumbs up from you guys? Yeah. Um, and as an adult, they look uh, similar to this, right Akito? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so um, this is a uh, bug guide is, is another a great place. You can find some, some photos of um, insects. Looks like Yuri and Andrea found that um, uh, Sarah Bissett, that longhorn beetle, so we're gonna check back with them. No, no, it's blurry. That Sorry, we have to switch the camera around. It's gotten blurry in the rain. Um, <laughs> yes, this is probably the genus Cryonis. It is one of our bigger longhorn beetles around here. Sometimes people hear them bumping into the windows at night about this time of year, um, and you might wonder what that is. So these actually, um, they will use these big strong jaws that maybe you can see on this beautiful beetle to chew into the bark of trees where they lay their eggs and then uh and also to defend themselves if i wasn't holding it by its side it would bite hard they don't like being held <laughs> but you honestly look at the anthony it's like like a comb it's just beautiful yeah very very long antennae which is where they get Bye. their Longhorned beetles. Okay, guys, so we're going to take a break from questions. We'll get back to some more oh, a little bit later. So but, um, I am going to move on and I want to cover a little bit, you know, why we're even out here. Why are, why are we collecting? Why, why are we looking at this stuff anyway? And, and who does it? Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to uh, Yuri first because Yuri, um, you know, we know you guys are scientists and we know that you like to get out there and collect things, but um, Yuri, does, does everyone have to be a scientist? Do you need to be a scientist to be out there and interested in, in collecting insects? Johnny came to me with this, this question because she knows my answer. I think it's the opposite. I think um, we're all born bug zealots. Not all, but most of us. And I certainly was. And I know a lot of young people who are born really liking everything that crawls, that lives around us. And then through this educational mechanism, we somehow beat it out of them. We tell them it's gross, it's ugly, let it go. Don't touch it. That's, that's unfortunate, really. There's just so much joy in knowing that this stuff is living around you and you're part of it, part of the bigger, bigger picture, the bigger mechanism of the environment. It's really amazing. No, you don't have to be a scientist, not at all. And some people would say it's the opposite too, that everybody who's paying attention to little things is a scientist. You, you can be a scientist. Thank you, inspiring. All right, so anyone can do it. This is a really great activity for families. Um, also, uh, date night. I know if somebody had taken me on a date night to collect bugs, oh man, that would have been the best ever. 
Um, but okay, but let's get back to scientists because that's who we're talking to, right? And maybe Andrea, can you tell us why why are scientists out there collecting for research, for fun? What what what's the deal? So there are so many reasons that people are collecting. One is that people don't realize this, but there are so many insects that we just don't know that much about. So you might be in your backyard looking at the insects thinking, I wonder what that is. And the answer might simply be, we don't have a name for it yet. Or if we have a name for it, we don't quite know what it does. So there's still so much that we have to learn about all the wildlife that's living all around us. Another reason that people collect, and this is something that my group works on a lot, is we collect because we don't know the distributions or the range that insects are occupying. And that includes things like invasive species. So even though we might be, be able to go out and do a big survey of a national park, everybody can't come into all the, the neighborhoods and all the personal backyards of everybody in your neighborhood to find out exactly where that new invasive species is. And it is Florida after all. It's a great place for lots of different kinds of critters to live. So it's very helpful when we have lots of people collecting to help us really understand the, the life cycles and distributions of these animals. And this is actually one of the reasons that research collections are so important. And so we really appreciate our museums and those specimens that they hold, giving us kind of a window into the past. Yeah, what a great segue, because Akito, I want to ask you if you can just really briefly give us an overview as to why research collections that you see at museums, like the Florida Museum of Natural History, um, you know, you guys may have hundreds of, of examples of the same species. You may have a lot of specimens of the same thing, and you still continue to collect them. Um, and that might seem counterintuitive to some people if we're saying that we're trying to protect a species. Um, why, you know, why are research collections so important? Why are museum collections really relevant? Yeah, so um, museum collections are really important because uh, they, they give us information about what kinds of organisms were where in the past uh, and also the present. Um, but the past is especially important because we need to understand where what's happening to them in, in this world. Right now, there's a lot happening with, with changing uh, environmental conditions. I mentioned light pollution before, but also things like warming, uh, you know, climate change, and things like this. And what happens is that these distributions are changing, and a lot of the species are, are shrinking their, their ranges. So we need to know the historical uh, distributions and the historical place they were, and what did they look like at that time. And that is really important and the way to do that is to look at the museum specimens because that is the information that we need to understand that and there's all kinds of ways to to use models and all kinds of really uh, really cutting edge approaches that we're using to to try to understand what's going to happen in the future given where they were before and so it's possible that something you collect now you're not even going to know how it's how you can use that in the future so um scientists that were collecting things a hundred years ago didn't know that maybe your lab would be taking DNA from that sample. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. We, yeah, they, they probably didn't know, didn't know that. And I mean, as, as, as an entomologist kind of growing up, I grew up in Japan originally, but uh, back then, you know, when I was a kid, I, I remember seeing lots of insects uh, of certain species. And now I go back and I don't see many of them. And I don't know what happened to them, but talking to local people, uh, a lot of them have disappeared or changed the ranges. And the only evidence I have is actually the collection, the specimens that I have in my own collection. Uh, so it's really important. Thanks. So Matt, if you're around, I'm going to circle back to you because, um, you know, I, we're, we're talking about sort of the, this um, connection between, you know, people that are just doing this for a hobby in their own backyard versus scientists. Um, if you're just somebody that wants to do this for a hobby or for fun in their own backyard, um, that's great. But I, I think you can actually make a difference there. You can have pretty impressive collections. Even there's examples from right here in Gainesville, are there not? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our old collections manager, George Austin, um, he did basically what we're doing right now tonight over the course of an entire year though. And in that year, he collected over 25,000 moths and over 800 species, which uh, really goes to show you that like we, you know, we, you need to come out and, and collect at night to know what's going on because we don't see this stuff during the day. And moths are incredibly important pollinators um, that do all their work at night. Um, so yeah, that's another good reason to be out there and, and just you know seeing what, what there is. 
Thank you. Andrew and Yuri, do you have something you want to add or are you just agreeing with Matt? Yeah, I was also going to mention one thing. I like what Akito said about that the collections are sort of a, a, a book that keeps being written by nature itself, by what we catch and we can go back in time really. But what we are also seeing is not just how some insects, many of them are, are going away. We're also seeing new bugs. Not all bugs are nice and cool. You know, some of them are invasive. We are seeing species that we have not seen ever before. Often in our sheets, in our collecting efforts, the first time we catch a new pest, you know, it can be in our backyard. Those are also important. And I can just add to that. I've been teaching insect classification at the University of Florida for years now. And almost every semester we get something new. Sometimes it's native things that we didn't know about. And sometimes it's new things, new records for the state. And this is just students over one semester going and collecting with their nets. So there's a lot that, of contributions that the public can make. Andrea, while you're talking about new things, I think there's probably something that a lot of us have seen in the news lately um, that um, kind of comes across as intimidating, but I'm wondering if you can um, tell us a little bit more about it. I mean, I, I so think- probably you're talking about those hornets, aren't you? I am. Okay, so a lot of questions have been coming in, um, not tonight, but just in general to entomologists about these hornets that have been in the news. First of all, I don't like these sensational names that people have been using to describe them. It's not really fair when we use human intentions to describe insects. They're not out there murdering anybody. They have life histories. This is the Asian giant hornet, and it is a really, really big insect. It is incredibly cool to see if you've ever seen pictures of it and people get very excited about their life histories how they work and just how big they are one thing i will say is that a couple of dead specimens have been found on the west coast of the united states they're not in florida they're not on the east coast and there are no established populations as far as we know so there's some good sources of information out there about them johnny's showing one right now the featured creature article about them and um, rather than sensationalize them, one of the things I would say is that when we think about exciting big insects, we should actually look at some of the interesting ones in our own backyards. So that, those silhouettes that initially, Johnny, you put up that, that page or everybody who's watching has access to those pages, there are some really cool insects that if you really want a treasure to hunt for, I suggest going after some of those. Things like Dobson flies, because goodness, they look so frightening. They're so big and scary looking, but the truth is that they're delicate really delicate and somewhat rare. So these, there are all kinds of insects that I think it's better for us to turn our attention to. Um, and those, when they hit the news, in some ways it's great for people to recognize insects are important. On the other hand, I don't think that it's really worth our time to be worried about those right now. Thanks, Andrea. Okay, so, um, I want to move on because I, I think our scientists have some other ways. Light sheeting is just one way to um, observe insects, right? And we have other ways that our scientists sort of um, collect or observe insects, and they sort of have a, a toolkit. Every every entomologist has their own sort of favorite um, favorite tool in in their um, back pocket. And I think our scientists have some of those that they want to talk about and show you. Sarah, I'm going to start with you because I think um, you have, um, do you still have a, a scope that you want to show us or, okay. Um, sure, I can talk about a couple of tools. One that um, I've been using throughout the evening tonight to show some of the insects a little close up. Um, and this is just, it's a little pocket microscope. Um, I just looked on Amazon the other day. They look to be about 30 to $40, so much less expensive than say a professional microscope. Um, and all it is, it's just plugged into my laptop out here and it has a little LED light. Um, and I've actually been really impressed with the quality um, and I can take photos with it. Um, so it allows me to see, even if I'm away from a microscope, some of the little tiny characters on some of these or things about these insects that differentiate them from other types of insects that aren't always easy to see just with the naked eye. Um, but if we have a minute, I actually want to talk to folks about iNaturalist. Is that okay now or should I, we talk about that later? Um, I think one of the, honestly, the coolest tools that's out there um, to help folks understand not only insects, but all of the living things that are around us, because there are so, the biodiversity of our earth is just so overwhelming, um, is a website called iNaturalist. And I'll just go ahead and share my screen here. 
Um, give me one second, get, get my homepage pulled up here. And now iNaturalist is both a website that you can access on your computer um, or on a phone, um, however you like, free list page and this is just what people um, what people I'm following and you can see the map of the planet all of the things that people are observing around the entire planet so this is any form of life at all you can take a picture or upload um, a sound even and get help identifying it and also identify for other people so it's crowdsourced um, so you don't have to be a scientist to use it anybody can use it um, and I'll just show you one of the observations that I made last night. I was out um, sitting at my sheet last night and I saw this really cool insect. Um, I've, had, I've been having trouble sh sharing it with all of you because it moves so quickly. Um, but when I saw it last night, I knew which family it was. It's the family Membra Membracidae, which is leafhoppers. And now if I didn't know, to, know that what family it was, I could have just said it was an insect or an invertebrate. And so when I posted that, I knew the family and I posted a couple of photos, the best photos I could get of it. And then the person who responded to me is actually an expert in this group. Um, and we were able to narrow down this particular insect to a tribe, but not to the level of species. And um, this expert and I actually had a discussion today about some of the difficulties in identifying different genera of these leafhoppers. Um, but really, honestly, you can just go, go out in your backyard and take a picture of plants animals, fungi, whatever it is you see. And it's actually been a really fun hobby for me while I've been home almost all of the time, um, is just go walking outside, taking a break from my computer screen and walking out into my backyard and just seeing what's there and taking photos of it. Um, and whether I know what it is or not, um, it's a really fun way to share things with the world um, and a really nice way to get identifications, even if you don't know how to really identify insects or use a guidebook. Anybody can do this. Absolutely. It's a great site. I highly recommend it. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. Um, Andrea, I, I think you have um, sort of a tried and true method that involves spit that you wanted to show us. Is this, is this something you're able to do or, oh, hold on here. Let me unmute you here. Yes. So, if you're working with little insects, and I work with ants, but this works for little beetles and some other little critters too, just don't do it with moths. So if it's small enough, you can lick your finger, touch it to the insect, and it will stick to your finger just because of the surface tension. Now, it doesn't sound very technical, that method, but my goodness, it works in a pinch when you don't have your collecting equipment. This beautiful necklace that I'm wearing is not so much a necklace, but it's actually a collection device. Technically, it's called an aspirator, but a lot of people who use them call them pooters. I don't know if in any other fields people do this, but certainly when people work on ants, named after a guy named William Coons, and it's a little vacuum device. You suck in this end, it's just a tube, like an aquarium tube, and it's attached to this other device, just a harder tube, and in between the two of them, and this is important, this is the key part, there's a little screen. And that's the part that prevents the bugs from going into your mouth. So you can suck them in by breathing in, put your finger over the end, and then if you have a little vial, you can just poop them out into the vial, and then you've captured your insect. Now, if you're extra fancy, you'll get an aspirator or a collection that has a collection device on it so that when you suck in on this side, the bug goes in, lands in here, but then doesn't go back up. And if you want to get extra fancy, or just stay extra safe, you can even get a filter on there. So this is a HEPA filter, and it will prevent fungal spores or even just bits of dust from getting into your lungs. So there are a number of reasons that you might want to use this, but you can also just make these out of tubing, the kind of tubing you might get at the aquarium store, a hardware store, um, and you can attach it to almost anything. So for example, a vial like this could be a good collection tube that you stick on the end of a, a very flexible tube for sucking in. These are just some great things that you can make at home that make it easier to pick up things without squishing them. Thanks, Andrea. Who knew HEPA filters were involved in entomology, right? 
And um, just so you all know, um, everybody at home, um, we're also going to include um, a link to um, a, website, a website called BioQuip. And at BioQuip, you can actually buy, you can purchase a lot of products, entomology related products. So you can purchase an aspirator like that. Um, or I think earlier you saw a few of our entomologists hold up sort of a, a mesh screen where they were keeping their moths. Um, and there are just tons of stuff that you can, you can, yeah, like Akito has there if you, if you can see him, if you've got the, the gallery view going. Um, and it's all kinds of equipment, anything an entomologist would ever want is on that website. So in that email that we send out to you after the, the show is over, um, you'll, find, you'll find that there. And um, Akito, do you wanna do you wanna talk about what you're holding up right there? And uh, you're gonna tell us a little bit about baiting, right? How do yeah. you get the bug? Uh, should I start with baiting or the sheet or the, the, the box? You've got the box. Let's start there. All right. So this box is uh, insects that have been collected here, collected here. They're all from this backyard. Um, of course, Luna moths down here. Um, and uh, there's things like the Io moth right here. This is an underwing moth. This is the Dobson fly that uh, Andrea was talking about earlier. I click beetle, the one that um, Sarah was talking about, all kinds of stuff. And this is just a small little fraction of, this, of the things that you can find. And um, this, this group of moths, the underwing moths, um, also Matt Standridge was talking about this earlier, they come to bait. So the way you get this is by light, but the best way to do it is actually by creating your own uh, bait trap. And so what you do is you, you, you get a bunch of stuff. And I got a bunch of stuff here. I hope you can see this. I don't know, can you see this? It's right here. Is this okay? Um, so here I have uh, beer, uh, that's important. Uh, and then you need some uh, things like sugar or molasses, um, and then a bunch of fruit. So here's a mango, some bananas. Usually you want them really rotten. Uh, you can go to the store and get really rotten fruits like peaches and things like that. And you mix this all up. And then you put it in a pot like this and you boil it. And you uh, get it really sweet and you let it sit for a while, it ferments and so forth. And then you use a paintbrush. You go to trees in your yard or, or elsewhere and you paint this onto the trees and you walk back and forth along this path and you will see all kinds of insects come to the, these, these traps. And there's lots of insects that actually don't come to lights, but they will come to something like this. So this is a specialized uh, way of attracting insects in another, in another way. Awesome, sounds like fun. And Akito, can you do that sort of any time of year? Is there a better time of year to do that than others? Uh, for uh, underwing moths and stuff, this time of year is very good. Um, it, it depends really where you know wh where you are and uh, so forth. But of course, um, moon uh, dark dark moon nights are the best. Great. Which, um, by the way, we um, are sort of in a, a new moon phase right now, which is what makes this time of the month really great for for collecting for collecting insects. Now we're getting we're coming up on nine thirty. Um, there's so much more we have on our list to talk to you guys about. Um, you know, collecting and insects is just a massive topic and there's so many more things we have on our list, but we do know that our hour is technically up. And if you have to go, we totally understand and we wanna thank you so much for coming and so much for being here. But uh, we are gonna send you an email after the show is over and there's an evaluation in that email and those are really, really helpful for us so we can tweak and sort of plan future, future virtual programs for you. Um, now, if you're able to stick around, our scientists um, are going to be here for a few more minutes to answer a few more of our questions because those have really been rolling in um, and maybe show you a couple more things. Um, and I think um, somebody else was gonna talk about how to keep caterpillars, um, do some caterpillar husbandry or even um, what that means basically just raising caterpillars. Um, so if you have to go, thank you so much. We really, we really enjoyed having you. Um, but if you wanna stick around, um, I'm gonna get back to some of these questions. Oh, I have one final poll for you apparently. I'm, okay, so those of you that are leaving and those of you that are staying, everybody let us know, um, how inspired do you feel? Do you think you're gonna get out there and collect insects again in the future? We've got a lot of yeses. I like, I like this poll. All right. This is great. Good responses. I like it. And you know what? And for, for those of us who would prefer to watch others do it, that's why we're here. And we've got enthusiastic scientists to, to show off what's out there. And uh, we can appreciate it um, from Zoom. All right, 
Now, if our scientists don't mind, I have a long list of questions. Um, so remember to give me a thumbs up if you're interested in answering the question. Okay, somebody um, wants to know if there are stink bugs in Florida. And I, I want to say that somebody in our group had a stink bug. Sarah, do you still have that hanging around somewhere or did it take off? It, uh, it flew away. Um, but yes, we have many species of stink bug in Florida, um, some of which um, are important, are, are pests for certain agricultural crops. But um, so that's what may, maybe some folks are familiar with is hearing about them in a negative light. Um, but like Yuri was talking about earlier with the bark beetles, bark beetles get a bad rap. Uh, stink bugs get the same bad rap. Most of them are just, most stink bugs are just out there minding their own business. Um, and not bothering anyone's crops or anybody really, um, unless you bother them, in which case all they've got for you is a little bit of a smell. Um, that's, and that's their defense to try to keep you from smushing them. So yeah, don't smush them. Um, I think that's actually a pretty effective defense in my opinion. But yes, we do have them here in Florida and I believe they're pretty much ubiquitous everywhere in the world. I think everyone probably has at least a few species of stink bugs where they live. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, now I see a really good question here. Um, so this is sort of a two-part question. Somebody wants to know about fireflies, that sometimes they see them in their yard, but um, what do they contribute to the environment, if anything, and do they pollinate? And so um, I, I want to ask our scientists, you know, what we hear a lot about bees being pollinators. What about the night shift? Is there anybody out there that's actually pollinating? I mean, Akito, you said luna moths don't even have a mouth, right? So are any, is anything out there pollinating? Um, and if, if wrapped up in that, you can ask, you can talk a little bit about, you know, the, uh, the importance of fireflies. That would be great too. That's to me? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so there's lots of insects that are pollinating at night. And this is just, you know, we, we think of bees and, and butterflies as kind of the main pollinators. But in reality, we now know that lots of moths are, are pollinating. There was a study that just came out very recently that showed that moths are one of the major dominant uh, groups of insects that are pollinating. It's just that we don't see them because we're usually not outside at night. But we know that there are flowers that are blooming only at night, right? So there has to be nocturnal pollinators, and it appears that many of these might be moths, uh, are moths. But there are also other, lots of other kinds of insects that we shouldn't forget about, like flies. Flies are really important. There was also, um, one of my colleagues recently showed, showed me that it looks like there's a, a mosquito that's pollinating. So we think of mosquitoes as these sort of horrible insects. There's, over, there's actually over 3,000 species on the planet, and many of them don't even seem like they're, um, you know, feeding on human beings or, or drinking, um, uh, you know, blood and things like this, but they might actually be involved in plant pollination. So that's also another thing to, to, to think about. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that, that's definitely um, part of the question. I'm going to come back to the fireflies, but I am screen sharing here um, a picture of an elephant mosquito, which is um, some a mosquito that you find here in Florida. Nikito, can you just briefly tell us a little bit, um, like, is this a mosquito you need to swat at because it's going to, you know, drink the blood or maybe not? Uh, so I'm not an expert on mosquitoes. I'll just be completely frank and tell you that that I, I don't know a lot about mosquitoes. But the, the person that's uh, cited here, Lawrence Reeves, is an amazing mosquito expert. Uh, many mosquitoes, I, I actually learned something really interesting recently. Um, this is, I think, a male mosquito. Um, they have these interesting, or some mosquitoes have these really long um, uh, mouth parts, or they, they have a biting mouth part, but they also have uh, these feathery uh, antennae that, that are used, um, and some males have that. Uh, so it's usually the female that's bite, that bites, but the, 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 the males, uh, and the males do not typically bite. They usually feed on um, uh, plants and other, other sources like that. But lots of mosquitoes do not bite human beings, and they're specialists on other kinds of animals or other kinds of things. So that's important, I think, to think about. Yeah, and this is an example of one of those mosquitoes. And um, actually, um, the larvae of these elephant mosquitoes eat other mosquito larvae that do bite us and um, can actually be used to control sort of the, the bad mosquitoes that, that we hear about. Now, um, does somebody want to speak to the importance of fireflies? Like what, you, you know, and maybe you can answer this as a broader question. Um, what, what good is any one species of insect? Or one group of insect? No takers, any of our, any of our scientists? Can, Yuri? I can attempt. Uh, I don't really 
how to answer that question scientifically. I just know how to sort of attempt to answer it from my own human, uh, from my own human centric view, which is that why do we keep trying to assign uh, some importance to things from like our own perspective? You know, it, it's this sort of agricultural point of view that we are we're ass assessing other things based on how they are useful to us. That's pretty self-centric, I would say. I think there is just so much out there. We don't even know how we fit in the grand scheme of things. How do we know about how mosquitoes fit within the grand scheme of things? You know, it's, um, it's just we're assessing it from, from our own ancient sort of utilitarian perspective, but there's so much beauty out there just for that beauty itself, just for that enjoyment of once you know something, that gives you so much happiness, just to know it. And then you become friends with it and it turn out, turns out those are your neighbors. You know, those beetles, they've lived here in a log for 12 years. They've been living here more than I've been living here. You learn that they're your neighbors. They don't have to be useful. Well put. Okay, we have some questions about citizen science opportunities. Um, I'm wondering, Andrea, um, if I can call on you for this one. Um, there's, um, we can add some of these to our email uh, list that goes out after, after the show as well. Um, but are there specific citizen science opportunities that um, anybody wants to talk about, any of our scientists? I know it looks like Andrea's off screen right now, but um, so Andrea has one that I'll include in the list after that we send out called School of Ants. Um, and of course, you know, Andrea does study ants. Um, and we'll send out um, some, some different, it looks like she's signed on here. Sorry, taking a minute to get coordinated here. Um, yeah, there are actually some really amazing citizen science opportunities out there. So if you're interested in, um, whether it's insects or plants or the stream water near your community, you can go to a place called SciStarter.org and that's just an aggregator. There are so many opportunities right now. It's been about, I don't know, 10, 15 years since citizen science projects really started popping up all over the place. I've been involved in one called School of Ants, which had people collecting ants in their backyards and then sending them in and my lab has been tracking, um, basically mapping these ants across the US and looking at things like, for example, um, invasive species or uh, introduced species and seeing, trying to reconstruct the history of how did they make their way across the US. So um, right now, I think there are actually some cool projects that, that I believe there's one run out of the museum on butterflies. And I think just in general, a lot of what people are doing right now on iNaturalist is actually providing a huge amount of data that's becoming compiled and really contributing to what scientists know about these different kinds of insects. But yeah, I encourage all of you at home, if you're interested, go contribute. We need your help. We can't do it alone. Thanks, Andrea. Um, okay, this is another moth question. What are the main predators of moths and are yellow jackets predators of moths? Any takers? Akito. Uh, sure, yes, yellow jackets can be predators of moths, especially the caterpillars. So, um, the, the caterpillars of the moths. So, yellow jackets uh, oftentimes, um, they, what they need for their young in their uh, hive is to bring back other insects. And they, what they do is they bring, um, they go out and they go hunting and they look for different kinds of insects and they bring them back to feed their young. And oftentimes, if they f come across a caterpillar, they will eat, they catch that caterpillar, bring it back, and feed it to the young. So, yes, they are predators of moths. The Adults are not generally predators, uh, are not prey to, to things like yellow jackets, but adults are more prey to things like bats that I mentioned earlier, or things like birds. Um, you know, in, in, this, in my yard, sometimes I see, uh, you know, in the morning after I you know, turn off the lights and so forth, the moths kind of fly away, but then there's all kinds of, you know, cardinals and all kinds of, uh, you know, Carolina wrens, things like this that come and the, they, they're just feasting off of the, the insects and moths. Great, thanks. We also have someone here who wants to know what the rarest moth you've ever found is. This is to me. Yeah. Um, I'm putting me on the spot here. Uh, so one of the most extraordinary experiences that I've had in my life was uh, when I was in uh, the Amazon looking for uh, some, some moths that produce ultrasound for some research. But in this 
process, uh, we set up a light like this in the jungle. And in the jungle, it's absolutely amazing. I mean, the sheet was literally covered to the point where you couldn't see any white. There was just so many insects on the sheets, you know, bugs over bugs on top of each other. It's like an entomologist's true, true dream, you know? And at this light, around four o'clock in the morning, I was so tired, uh, but I wanted to stay there because it was my first time in the tropics. Uh, and this giant moth called Thysania agrippina came. It's, it's this gigantic moth that's like literally this big. I've read about these things in, in books when I was a kid and, and I saw one of these things. It, it was, it's not the rarest moth, but it is one of the most um, spectacular experiences that I've had in my life when I saw that. I'll never forget that experience. And it was just, it was absolutely amazing. Thanks, Akito. So we have a, another question about what species are good to keep as pets. And um, I think somebody wanted to talk about um, sort of the, the husbandry of moth caterpillars specifically since we're talking about nocturnal insects tonight um, and how easy it is to keep those. And I, I think Gary, you were that person. Yeah, I call that caterpillar husbandry. It's really easy to catch one of those Luna moths, for example, that Akido loves so much. And we have uh, cages and cages full of caterpillars. Really easy to grab a female of any, any of those big fuzzy moths. They typically are from the family that is easy to sort of put in a cage and she will lay eggs. Look up what it is, look up what the, their babies eat and just put a branch uh, on a, on like in a vase on a piece of uh, uh, newspaper and eventually they will hatch and uh, you will have an amazing time for a month or two or three raising caterpillars and then turning them into, uh, into moths. You know what, citrus is great too. And all kinds of garden plants, dill, they attract caterpillars. So you don't even have to catch the moth. You can just collect the caterpillars and you already know which plant it's on. So just put that in a vase. And that's not just for fun. What you're also doing is you're actually hiding these caterpillars from natural predators and parasites and birds and such. You're really helping the species. This is not like stealing it from nature. You're helping them because you're feeding them the right thing and you're protecting them through their development and then you're gonna let them go. It's a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. I have some um, on my own kitchen table right now. Um, but two great points that Yuri made is that um, if you know what plant you're looking at, what host plant you're looking at, that helps you identify what caterpillar you're looking at. And alternatively, um, if you have a caterpillar eating something, um, Butterflies and moths can be kind of picky about what they eat, right? They need a specific host plant. So um, make sure you try to figure out what that, that caterpillar is or, or what plant you took it off of because it probably needs to eat that same type of plant. Um, you can't just give it grass or something like that um, in order for it to grow into a healthy adult. And uh, one of the, so Yuri was also talking about uh, cages and that's those, those mesh cages that our scientists keep holding up. Um, that are really great for, for um, keeping butterflies and moths. And uh, Luna moths are a really great one um, to, to keep. And uh, Matt, I think you have some butterflies as well. Um, I don't know if you still have those around with you. I do actually, yes. Um, let's see if we can see if you guys can see this. Um, so this here is a giant swallowtail uh, it's a, a very recognizable um, butterfly. It's large, yellow, and brown, um, but they feed on citrus. And this is one that I collected from my backyard. It was, it was I found it on a wild lime tree. Um, and well, they have a really neat thing, uh, Osmeterium. It's this uh, kind of um, uh, Thank you. gooey forked append appendage that comes out of the top of their head and it smells pretty awful, um, but it's a great defense against predators. It keeps away wasps and lizards and other things. And uh, one of the other neat things about these guys is that they, they camouflage themselves by looking like bird or lizard poop, which I'm not sure if you can really see this that well, but um, I, I promise they do. Um, so I also have some black swallowtail caterpillars that I found on my parsley out back. Um, and they eat parsley, dill, cilantro. Um, very neat looking caterpillars. Um, Can you get that a little bit closer? And they are also, 
Yeah. And I'm trying to angle the. Can you see that? It's a, right. a little fuzzy, but we I think we we know it's there. And this is okay. Like, yeah. Um, go ahead. It's like the parsley that. I'm we, sorry. It's the parsley that we eat. Yeah. Yeah, same stuff. I have an herb garden out back, and they're 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 eating that stuff. So I can understand some people not liking them for eating their herbs, but uh, but they are really cool little caterpillars. Um, and these uh, these are uh, Eumea satala or a Kunti hair streak, and these guys are mainly found in South Florida, but they're um, really cool looking caterpillars. Uh, they almost look like gummy worms, but you would not want to eat them. Uh, they're defensive strategy is not camouflage, but advertising their, their bright colors, uh, which is letting things like lizards and birds know that they are extremely toxic to eat. Like you can touch them, it's fine, but if you were to eat them, probably make you sick. Thanks, Matt. Okay, so um, somebody's asking about um, a decline in the number of flying insects in the area. And this is also something that I think we've been hearing in the news, um, just the decline in insects in general. Um, do you all as scientists observe that as well? Or um, is this just something that you're seeing in the headlines and not actually observing? Akito, you wanna tell us a little bit? Well, I, I would just say that, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a balance, right? I mean, like what, what Yuri said earlier, we are seeing increases of, of species, but we're also seeing lots of declines. And I would, I would say that, you know, the, the experience that I had when, when I was a child looking at insects and, and, you know, kind of being interested in them and then going back to Japan where I grew up uh, now and seeing, I mentioned this earlier, but just seeing that they aren't there anymore is really, really eye-opening. And I think this is really important for uh, teaching our kids too that, you know, to, to know what's out there. And, and once you start to see and have this vision of the, the nature that's around you, you, you will always have that for the rest of your life. And that is so, so important for, for our kids and the next generation, I think. And so I, I encourage everybody that's here to, to, to take your kids outside and, and show them stuff and, and, and try to educate them because they will be able to see those kinds of changes too over, over time, which is something that I really feel, feel now. Thanks, Akita. So on a lighter note, I'm not sure if anybody will know the answer to this, but we have a question that says, um, this is directed at you again, Akito, um, that um, it looks like a parent is telling their child that um, the creator of Pokemon was inspired by his childhood of insect collecting. Do you know whether or not this is true? Yes, yes, it is true. So um, Pokemon and a lot of Japanese um, animation films were inspired uh, or the, the, the creators of these, these films are, were created, uh, were very highly inspired by, by insects. So a great example um, is Hayao Miyazaki, who's a, he was the um, director of Spirited Away and lots of other films that have shown up here in, in the United States that are covered by Disney and so forth. But if you watch these films, there's all kinds of kind of bug-like things that come out or the, the main character, you know, their goal is to protect nature and, and things like this and lots of insect themed characters and, and sign, you know, uh, images and things like that. So, so yes, that is, that is true. Bugs are, yeah, is it, inspired a lot of Japanese uh, uh, people. All right. All right, everyone, it is um, way past our 9.30 deadline. So um, unless our scientists have any more uh, big showy stuff that they wanna show off, maybe they can all hold something up to their screens. Um, we are gonna have to sign off. And I do wanna say huge thank you to all of the people that are working behind the scenes that you don't see tonight. We have people compiling questions and monitoring and helping out. Um, you all feel free to turn your cameras on if you want to, or unless you're in your pajamas and take a virtual bow. Thank you for helping. Thank you to our scientists, but mostly thank you to everybody at home because we could not have done this without you. Um, take, uh, keep a look out. Thank you, Albert Alberto. He's been helping out. Chelsea, thank you. Um, keep a look out for that email that we're going to send you with the survey and all kinds of fun links to everything that we've talked about tonight. I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question. Um, but maybe some of those questions will be answered in the links that we sent afterwards. So thank you so much. Have a great weekend and hope we can see you all in person soon. Good night. Bye.